Amen. So this story and these characters are, I would say, they're absolutely iconic. Everybody knows about them. Like you could talk to any church person about Mary and Joseph, and we know all the different pieces of their story. We talk about it every single year, all the big moments with them. Um, there's songs about them, right? Mary, did you know? Great song, right? All about this stuff. There's movies about the nativity story. It's famous, it's iconic within church, but also I think if you talk to any person who doesn't go to church, like ever, they would know still all about this story. Mary and Joseph and the way that all of that happened, the birth of Jesus, it's all over the place. It's just a super iconic story. And it's funny because I was talking about watching Christmas movies with my kids. We are watching all these Christmas movies and in these Christmas movies that have nothing to do with Jesus at all, all these songs are in those movies about Jesus and about the birth of Jesus. We're watching The Grinch, the new animated one. And like, there's a huge section in that song that's God rest ye merry gentlemen. And they sing all those words and all that stuff about the birth of Jesus, even all over the place. So it's just huge everywhere. It's iconic. It's a big deal. Everybody knows all about it. And so that's true. But then I think also it's a huge deal and it's significant within the context of just scripture itself. This is a huge moment. This is a big deal. It's significant because it's super significant in the story of our Bible. That's why it's such a big deal. And that's kind of where I want to start this morning is thinking about how much the people of God have been waiting and looking forward to this moment. There's been so much expectation and so much waiting and so much excitement for thousands of years as they have looked forward to the coming of a Messiah. So much anticipation, waiting desperately for this thing to happen. And the closest thing that I could think of in my life to that was Avengers Endgame, okay? If you're, if you're a Marvel movie fan in here, you're good, track with me. If you're not, I'll see you in a couple minutes, okay, when I'm done with this story. Um, but if you remember, in 2008, so a hundred years ago, there was a movie that came out called Iron Man, okay? Iron Man came out. It's an awesome superhero movie, very fun. At the end of that movie, after the credits, there was a scene that popped up where Samuel L. Jackson walks on the screen with an eye patch, and he's like, hey, Tony Stark, I want to talk to you about the Avengers Initiative. And all the nerds in the theater were like, ah! You know, because we, like, we know what that means, right? They're going to start to build this team of superheroes. And then movie after movie comes out of this new character and this character and this character. And you're like, we're building towards something. And then Avengers came out in this movie where they're all teaming up together. Awesome movie. At the end of that movie, there's the credits. And then this another scene pops up at the end of those credits. And it's this brand new bad guy named Thanos. And everybody's like, ah! Because we know what that means, right? We're building all of this stuff. And so then movie after movie after movie builds to this movie called Avengers Endgame, okay? And I was out of my mind excited for this movie when it came out. I couldn't wait. I remember I watched one trailer, but then I was like, I'm not watching anything else because I don't, I don't want to even know. I've, I was off the internet for like three weeks leading up to that movie because I didn't want to hear a thing about it. I just wanted to go in and experience it. I was pumped. I had tickets for opening day. Went and saw Avengers Endgame, and it changed my life forever. Not really, but I, but I remember thinking, sitting, like, getting ready to watch the movie. I was like, in, in a weird way, without even really knowing it, I've been waiting for this movie since 2008. And I'm so excited to watch it because it has been this steady build waiting for this movie to come out, which is sort of the end of all of that story. And in a much less silly but more real sense, I think that's the feeling that God's people have. That's the anticipation. We just cannot wait for this thing to happen. Since Genesis chapter 3, there have been these clues and hints that somebody's coming to fix all this stuff. Somebody's coming to make right everything that's broken. There's going to be a, a, a savior, a hero, a messiah that is going to come and make everything better. In 700 something, you know, around there, 700 years before the birth of Jesus, we get this verse in the book of Isaiah, and he's prophesying about the coming Messiah. This is what he says in Isaiah chapter 9. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David. That's an important uh, line there, so remember that. For all eternity, the passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. 
There's all this anticipation from God's people looking forward to when this is gonna happen. There's gonna be a day where somebody comes along and does this and he's a wonderful counselor and a mighty God, an everlasting father, a prince of peace. To his rule and reign, there's gonna be no end. He's just, he's gonna bring peace. All of this wonderful stuff that they are desperately waiting for and are so excited for it to happen. And what we're looking at this morning is the moment that it does happen the moment that it arrives, all of this waiting and anticipation for this. So here's what I wanna ask us. I want us to engage our imaginations and I want us to think if we were those people so looking forward to this moment, the arrival of the Savior, the Messiah, how do you think it would go? Like what, if you were asked to come up with how this is gonna happen, how would you write it? What would your expectation be for this moment? And I'd be willing to bet for, uh, and I'm thinking about myself here, but for, probably for all of us, that none of us would write it like it actually happened. None of us would come up with that. None of us would say, oh, this is how it's gonna happen. We would think so differently about how the story should unfold if we could have written it. But it happened so different from what people would have thought, and I think what we would have thought if we were there. So today, as we look at the story of Mary and Joseph, that's what I want us to think about, is how God works through the unexpected. God works through... Um, Sometimes when our expectations look a certain way, things happen completely different and that's on purpose. And God's gonna teach us some things through the story of Mary and Joseph about our expectations and how to look at them. Because we all have expectations in our life. We all have, this is how I think my life is gonna go. And I make plans and goals, which are super good. And I am pro plan and goal, I'm not saying that. But we make all this stuff about, this is how I want my life to be. And then my expectation based on those goals is that's how it's gonna look. Every, you know, everything's going to progress in this way, and that's how my life is going to look. And I've got an expectation for how my life is going to go, and I expect it to go a certain way. And I remember, um, so I, when I was at Bible college, and it was right before Mother's Day, and the church that we were at for Bible college was this big church. There's all these campuses all over the place, and Mother's Day is a big deal, as it should be. And so they were sending all these different people to all these other campuses to help out with Mother's Day because it was such a big deal. And I was asked to go to this campus and it was kind of far away. And so we had to leave my house at four in the morning to get there by the rehearsal time, which is just terrible, you know? <laughs> and I should have said no, just kidding. But um, so anyway, so I get picked up by this guy named George Whippy is his name. And this is before I've proposed to Sarah. We're sort of, we're dating, but n none of that's happened yet. And I'm, I'm riding in the car with George at like 4.30 in the morning. And he just kind of asks me like, you know, tell me about yourself, like what, you know, what, what's your goals? What do you want to do? Just get, give me the plan. And George is just the most incredible guy. So just such a man of God, so funny, so wise, just incredible. When you spend time with him, you just, it just feels so good. And so I start to tell him the plan. I'm like, okay, so the plan is probably, you know, two to three years or so, I'll propose to Sarah, maybe a little sooner, maybe two years, probably more like I'll propose to Sarah. Um, we'll finish out some school stuff. And then uh, we'll move to LA. That's where we're gonna go and live there. And there's a church there that's awesome. And we're gonna go serve there. But we're so awesome that they'll hire us right away. So I'm not even worried about that. And uh, then we'll live in LA. And then maybe two, three years after that, we'll start to have kids, that whole thing. We'll build a family and it's gonna be awesome. And that's kind of the plan. That's kind of how I see it going. And George is like, that's awesome, man. Love that for you. And then he kind of got this smile and he was like, but maybe none of that's gonna happen. Yeah. And I was like, Excuse me, you know? But he's like, maybe, uh, and then he kind of, in, in hindsight, it's totally prophetic. He goes, maybe you'll, maybe you'll get married way sooner than you thought. You know, maybe, what, what if that happened? And maybe you'll have kids way sooner than you thought. And maybe you won't go to LA, you know? Maybe you'll go somewhere else, you know? And I was like, I mean, I guess that could happen, but I've got some expectations about how my life is gonna look. But sure enough, Sarah and I got married way quicker than I had said at that moment. And we got married. And then again, Sarah and I, like probably a lot of couples do, we're like, oh, we'll wait a couple years and then we'll have kids. That couple years was six months. And then we were like, oh, we're having a baby. So that's, that's not what we thought. It's unexpected for sure. I did move to LA, W-T-O-N. So that's cool. <laughs> that part was correct. So I got one point on my <laughs> expectations. But all this stuff that I thought was going to happen, this is how my life is going to look, none of that is how my life looks now. And thank God for it. 
And I'm so happy with where my life is, and I would have it no other way. But I had expectations. This is how my life's going to look, and that's not how it happened. I think all of us have those expectations of how life is going to look. And what I think this story teaches us is when we make our expectations the ultimate and the goal and what is good, and if we get off those, what that means is something is wrong and I have to fix it, maybe, maybe not. And, and I think what's even more dangerous is when we start to live in a place where God owes me my expectations, because I've been faithful, because I've been good, because I've done this, that, and the other. This is how I want my life to look, and so God, please just do that. And I start to think I deserve my expectations, and that's also not necessarily the case. And so now, with all that as the sort of backdrop, let's look at the story of Mary and Joseph. So this is Luke chapter 1, 26 through 27. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, he talked about her last week, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. So we'll pause there. So remember last week we had Zechariah and Elizabeth, and this is the Elizabeth that was just referenced in that verse. Her and Mary are family, they're cousins. Um, and so there's some time that they spend together. But the other thing that happens in both Luke and in Matthew, it gives, right before this, it gives a genealogy. All these different, this person had this person and it goes on down the line all the way to Jesus. And what it's doing is it's tracing Jesus's ancestry all the way back to King David. That's the, that's the point of what's happening. And a lot of scholars think that Luke's genealogy is talking about Mary, tracing her ancestry. And then Matthew's is focusing on Joseph. And there's a lot of people think that, some don't. But the point is either way, that we're tracing the genealogy of Jesus to David, which is super important. If you remember from the book of Isaiah that we just looked at, it said that he's gonna be an ancestor of, or David's gonna be his ancestor. He's gonna come from the line of David. And so it's just this little clue, even with just the, the genealogy of Jesus, that he comes from the line of David and that's important and significant in how people have been looking forward to him arriving and how God is orchestrating all of this. And so she and Joseph are descendants of David and that's important. But what that means in the moment for them is nothing. Like that doesn't make them special or significant. A lot of people are in that lineage and so they're not special. And so I think what I want us to see from this just little section here is like, who is Mary? Nobody. Who's Joseph? Nobody. Nobody. There's nothing about them that's super special or significant from any other person. And where, where do they live in Galilee? That's nowhere. Nothing, nothing happens in Galilee. There's nothing good about Nazareth. There's no cool coffee shops anywhere in Nazareth. I'm sure of it. Um, and so they're nobodies who live in an absolute nowhere. And there's even a funny moment later on in the gospels when Jesus has grown up and he's gathering disciples. There's this little moment where there's a, a, a soon to be disciple named Nathaniel. And this is what he says in John 1 46. He goes, Nazareth, exclaimed Nathaniel, can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see for yourself, uh, yourself, Philip replied. So there's this understanding of like Nazareth, like that place is lame. Like nothing happens there. You know, how could something like that happen in Nazareth? I think it would be like saying, the Messiah's from Bushyhead, Oklahoma. That's a real place, people. I looked it up this week. Does anybody know Bushyhead? Nobody here or in first service, okay? It's like, he's from Slapout, Oklahoma. You know Slapout? There's one, okay. I know one Slapout over here, okay? It's like saying Altus. Just kidding. There's no, 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 no. Just kidding. But again, it's just this point. It's like, these two people are just, there's nothing special about them. They're just living their life in a small little town that has nothing special about it. Like what good can come from Nazareth? So the scene so far is that these two nobodies who live in nowhere are about to be visited by Gabriel and chosen to be the earthly parents of Jesus, the Messiah. It is a crazy story. And I think we're, again, we get so used to it. We're told that every single year, it's so pervasive in our culture, Mary and Joseph, Bethlehem, the, the manger, the shepherds, all of it. It's such a bizarre story. We get so used to it, but I want us to just to recapture for a moment with fresh eyes how weird this is. This is not how we would have thought it would go. It's crazy that this is how it happens in a random town in the middle of nowhere with two very ordinary people. So let's keep reading. Luke 1, 28 through 33. Gabriel appeared and said, greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. 
He will be very great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. Again, going back to the Isaiah verse. And he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Again, right there at the end, all those phrases are talked about in Isaiah, this never ending rule and reign of Jesus. So the common reaction to seeing an angel we see in scripture is like fear. She's confused and disturbed. And Zechariah, we talked about last week, was totally afraid when he saw the angel. The shepherds later in this story are terrified when they see angels. There's something about when the presence of God like that just happens right in front of you. It's a terrifying thing. It kind of freaks us out. But the angel tells her, don't be afraid for you have found favor with God is the phrase that he says there. And um, favor in Greek is the word charis, which means grace or kindness. So I think a really a, 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 an accurate sort of representation of what's being said there, because I, I think I've read it in the past as, hey, you found favor with God because you're awesome. So God's found like God's going to do something cool because you're so great. And I think the more accurate thing is God's just going to show up to you and show you his kindness and his grace right now. Yeah. And it's not anything about Mary necessarily, but it's just God saying, hey, I'm going to pour out kindness and grace and favor on you. That's what's happening. So again, with our imaginations here, if we're Mary and we're like 14 and we're living in this middle of nowhere place and we have an angel appear to us and say, hey, God's going to show his kindness and his grace to you. What's going to come out of his mouth next? You're thinking like we get to move, right? Like we get to go somewhere else or like I get a raise at work or whatever, like I, something good. Like if God's going to show his kindness to me, it's going to change my circumstances in some way for the better. Something's going to happen. I'm, like I'm going to get you know, more standing within my community. Something good's going to happen. I'm going to get a new house, whatever it is, right? Hey, God's going to pour out his kindness and grace on you. What do you think the angel would say next if you're her? But what he says is you're going to have a baby and you're not married yet. And this is a small town and everybody knows you. And there's absolutely no way that you're going to be able to hide this. Everybody's going to know, right? Like that's what God's going to do for you. That's the kindness. And you're like, Mary would be like, huh? Like that, like what what are we talking about here, Mr. Gabriel, sir? Like how how, how is this going to work? What is this going to mean? You're going to have a baby and he's going to be the Messiah, the one that we've all been waiting for for so long is coming and you're going to be his mother. So moving on, Luke 1, 34 and 30 through 37, Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I'm a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the most high will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month for the word of God will never fail. So Mary responds, I think by asking sort of, yeah, like the obvious million dollar question right there of like, how is this going to happen? Because there's a big thing that needs to happen for this to happen and it hasn't happened. So what, you know, how, what's going to happen? The angels, you know, hey, God's going to do this. God's going to accomplish this thing and no word from God will ever fail. Right? So he, he, he says all of this stuff to Mary. She asks her questions. Hey, God's going to do this. So let's talk about the elephant in the room, I think, in this situation is that Mary's life has just changed 100% from what she thought it was going to be. Mary, I'm sure, had expectations of her life, what it was going to be. She's about to get married to this great guy, Joseph, who we're going to talk about in a second. And then she's going, to, so she's going to be his wife, and then they'll have a family, and they'll start to do all these things. She's got plans, I'm sure, for her life, expectations. And this angel shows up, and now none of that seems like it's going to happen at all. Like, everything's changed for me. There's nothing about her life that is going to be the same as what she thought. What's her family going to think? Are they going to believe her? My guess is no. Like, would you believe somebody when they said that to you, right? Is Joseph going to believe her? We read he totally does not at the beginning, right? There's this great little video thing. I saw this last week and it was like imagining and it was Joseph and he like, he brought a cake to Mary and he's like, hey, I made you this cake. And she's like, what do you mean? He's like, I made it from scratch. And she's like, we don't have an oven. And he goes, God baked it. And she's like, and he goes, you see how that sounds, Mary? You know, he's like, come on, you know? Like, it's just, it's, it's all like, so again, up to this point, God's been silent for 400 years and all this Galilee people are supposed to be like, and he just broke that by talking to you about this, you know, like it's crazy. It's absurd. What does everybody think? What does Joseph think? What do the people in Galilee think her family? It's all wild. And her life has changed completely now. 
from what she thought it was gonna be. We do get in Matthew's account of sort of all of this that Joseph didn't believe her and he decided to divorce her quietly, which tells us some awesome things about Joseph and what a, what a man he was. Because he could have made a huge public spectacle out of that and brought tons of shame and he could have got a lot of stuff from that. But he decides, no, I'm not gonna do that and we'll do this super quietly so that way she doesn't have a lot of this stuff and there's no shame to her or as much as I can help her not have in this situation. So he's an awesome guy. But we see this in Matthew 1, 20 through 21. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit and she will have a son and you are to name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. And so Joseph gets a visit from the angel as well and he's on board. They're in this together now, Joseph and Mary. And so all of this has happened, right? The angel has shown up. He's you know, brought the message to Mary and Joseph. She's gonna get pregnant and they're in all of this situation. Everybody knows, I'm sure around town, everybody's you know, figuring out what's happened with her and they're trying to guess. And I'm sure there's tons of conversation and rumors and whispers and gossip. All of that has happened. And for both Mary and Joseph, I think it's safe to say expectations of their life are out the window. Like what they thought it was gonna look like is no longer happening. All expectations out the window. But here's where I think Mary shows up as one of the greatest teachers in our whole Bible with what she says in this moment. Again, all of this stuff the angel has said, her life is gonna change completely. And this is what she says in Luke chapter one, verse 38. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. So she just says, absolutely, right? Like all these expectations in my life, I'm gonna lay those down. And I'm gonna pick this up. And it, she's glad to do it. May everything you've said about me come true. I'm 100% in. And I'm gonna do this. And I'm gonna walk this out with you. Mary, I think something clicks in her. Something happens in her spirit where she goes, okay, I'm gonna lay down. I'm gonna sacrifice my expectations of my life. And I'm gonna pick up what God has for me and the path that he has called me to walk. That's what I want. I, I, I'm, I'm happy to lay down the expectations of my life to pick up where God is actually leading me. Because my expectations of my life were awesome and great, but I'd rather be over here on the path that God has for me. That's what I want. And even if it throws my life out of whack, even if it changes everything I thought was gonna happen, even if it puts me in a weird position, that's where I wanna be. Because God is on that path and he's gonna walk that out with me and that's where I wanna be. And I think we, in this story, I think we see that we find peace by walking God's path for our lives, not because that path matches our expectations, right? We find peace walking God's path because he's on that path. Amen. He's the presence where we find peace. And I wanna go where he's going. And even if it's completely different from what I thought was gonna happen in my life, I want to follow God and what he has for me. And that's how I'll experience peace. There's a great moment in the Old Testament when Moses is in the, in the wilderness with Israel. And there's a moment where God sort of says to them, he kind of gives them this choice. He goes, hey, you guys can move forward and go to the promised land and have all that stuff, but I'm not gonna go with you. Or we can continue on the path that I have set for us. And Moses says, we absolutely wanna go with you. Like e even if we could get all the stuff we wanted, but you're not there, that's not worth it to us. We want to walk the path that you have for us Amen. with all of its wines, with all of its whatever, because you're on that path. And I think Mary, something happens in her in this moment. She goes, that's what I want. If I want peace, if I want fulfillment, if I want to, to have that kind of life, it's following where he's leading, even if it's completely different from what I thought. He is with me, so I have peace. The path that he's on, where he's leading me, that's where I wanna go. And, and this is the idea of the whole rest of this story. Because from here on out, absolutely nothing goes according to what the plan I'm sure would have been, right? If she has a birth plan, nothing on that plan happens for her, okay? Because this is how I imagine it. They'll be like, well, at least we'll get to have the baby here at home, right? No, no. We have to go all the way to Bethlehem, which is like super far away. We have to ride a donkey. So we're gonna be in this strange place that she's probably never been to in her life. And that's where we're gonna have the baby. 
Okay, well, at least when we get there, we're going to have a nice hotel and some doctors and all that. No, 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 no. You're going to be in a barn with a donkey, you know? Like, that is not what you would want if you're Mary or Joseph. Well, at least it'll be the two of us, right? And we'll get to share this moment together, you and I. No, a bunch of shepherds are going to show up, like these strangers out of nowhere, stinky, smelly people. They're going to be like, <gasps> like looking at you as you've just given birth to a baby, you know? Like, none of this is what you would think. None of this is what you would plan. The whole, I think, three, first, you know, a couple chapters of Luke should just be Mary having a panic attack, you know? Like, this is awful, and it's not what I thought, but that's not what they are. And why? Why is it that it's not Mary just freaking out for three chapters? And it's because she does something where she goes, I'm going to lay down my expectations and pick up what God has for me. Amen. And I can have peace in that. And even if all these things don't look how I thought, I'd rather be on this path because that's what God has for me. She lays down her expectations. And so this is where I asked this question of myself this week as I was writing all this. Do I interpret the craziness in my life to me and I've gotten off the path and so I need to work really hard to get back on my expectations? I think for a lot of us, that's how we do it. If something's getting weird and things are getting crazy and they're not what I thought, I think that means something's wrong and I've got to fix it to get back on the track that I thought and to get back to what my expectations were. Something obviously has gone wrong and I've got to fix it. But I think what this story is teaching us, rather than to fight tooth and nail immediately when things get out of hand to get back on the track that I thought I should be on, what if instead I paused and I asked the question and I prayed and I went to God and I said, what, what's this new thing that maybe you're doing in my life? What, what is it that that maybe you have for me now? What path am I on this time? Like, is this a moment where I need to lay down my expectations and I need to follow you because you're actually doing something? I need to not fight about it and freak out and panic, but I need to realize my expectations were never the goal. I wanna follow you. And if you've got me going over here, that's where I wanna be because that's where I'll find peace, even if everything is different from what I thought. Amen. How do you interpret those moments in your life? And I think the challenge for us from this story to pause and to reflect and think and pray, what is God teaching me in this? Where is he leading me on this path? And so now I got three, I think, points, three things that I think we can learn, three things to know from this story about peace and how to walk that path of peace that I think God has for us when it comes to our expectations. So number one, peace is not just all the things in my life looking how I want them to look. That's not what peace is. Again, I think we get so glued to our expectations. This is what I want it to be. And if it doesn't happen like that, then, then my life is chaotic and I have a lack of peace. There's expectations that I have. And if it doesn't happen like that, I start to freak out. And I think that the peace is now gone and I've got to work to get it back. When my son was probably three years old, his name's Reese. We took him to the doctor's office, okay? And Reese is very much a person who wants to know the plan, like from a, from a very early age, what's gonna happen? What are all the different steps? What do I need to expect, right? That's who Reese is. And so we prepped him for this doctor's appointment. Here's what's gonna happen, right? They're gonna weigh you. They'll get, like, probably check your height. They'll take you into a room and then they're gonna like look in your ears. They'll look in your mouth. They'll look in your eyes. They'll press around your stomach and stuff. They'll listen to your heart. They'll listen to your lungs, you know, they'll check your reflexes, or as he calls them, his free flexes, which is awesome. My uh, free flexes. But like, this is what they're going to do. And everything that we said is what happened, except they asked Reese to take his shoes off when he got weighed. And you would have thought that they told him an alien was living in his brain. Like he <laughs> lost his mind because he wasn't prepared for the shoes. He's like, I have to do what? Like I have to take my shoes off, right? He lost it, little three-year-old Reese in this doctor's office because something happened that wasn't expected, right? And so now everything fell apart in his life. And I think sometimes that's what my life looks like. I've got my plan. This is what I want. And when it doesn't happen, I start to freak out and think something's wrong and I need to work to get it back. And I think what we learned from Mary's story is that sometimes God has us on a path that looks different from what we thought and that's okay. Amen. But Mary has peace even in the midst of that. And so I think this verse here is super helpful. This is Isaiah chapter 26, verse three. It says, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. There's a perfect peace that you and I can live in and it has nothing to do with how our life is going. It has nothing to do with the expectations that we thought. Israel, when this was written, like it's a terrible time for them. There's no 
peace, as we would call it, I think in a worldly sense. But what, what happens here is he goes, if you trust God and keep your thoughts fixed on him, you can have perfect peace even as everything else around you is crazy and different from what you thought and not at all where you wanted to go and not at all what you thought was gonna happen. Like if you can trust God and walk in that, you can experience peace. I think Mary exemplifies this. She could be freaking out and I'm sure she had her moments, right? I'm sure there were tons of moments for her where she started to feel like, man, this is not what I wanted it to be. This isn't what I thought, but I think she's got this spirit in her that just continues to go, but I'm gonna trust him. Like he said, this was gonna happen. I believed it. And so I'm gonna keep walking that out. I trust him. And when things get crazy, I don't focus on those things. I focus on him. I fix my thoughts on God. And that's how she, and I think that's how we can experience perfect peace. So peace is not just the things in my life looking how I want them to look. Peace isn't also, let me say this, peace isn't just ignoring everything that's happening and just pretending like it's not there. It's very much recognizing all of those things, but still living in that place right here that I think goes, but I trust you. And if you've got me here, then I can trust you and have peace even in the midst of some crazy situations. So that's number one. Number two, peace is found in God's approval, not people's. Peace is found in God's approval, not people's. And I think that Mary's story is, is, it hits this so hard because again, like think about what would have happened to her? Everybody would have been like, oh my gosh, can you believe what Mary must have done? All of the rumors, all the talk, all of that stuff. But Mary, even though all that's happening, she seems to have this like, but I'm, like that doesn't matter to me what you're saying. And I'm just gonna continue to trust in what God said to me. And that's what I'm concerned about. And she has peace through all of that. Even though everybody's talking about her, she has peace because she's for living for God's approval, not people's. And I think this is a huge thing for us because don't we just want people to like us? Like, isn't that such a burden in our heart? Like, I feel that so strongly. The amount of effort that I put forward to be liked by people and to have approval from people is there's so much that I do all the time. So much effort that I put into, I just want people to think I'm cool. I want people to think that I'm okay, that I've got things figured out. And like, this is the cliche example, but as I was thinking about it this week, it's true for me that like you take the family photo and the one that you post is every smiling and it's beautiful, but the other like 257 photos are like war, you know? There's punching and biting and fighting and crying and everything. But I don't, I, I, like I delete those. And I think as I thought about it this week, underneath all the reasons why I delete those, the real core down there is I don't want you guys to think I'm a bad parent. And so I'm gonna put forward the best example that I possibly can so that way it looks like I'm doing good and I've got it figured out because I want your approval. Like that happens all the time, I think, for so many of us that we want the approval of people. We put all of that effort in and that's a silly example with the photos, but I think it's true to, it, for us in our core that a lot of times we do so many things that we want other people to approve of us. And Mary finds a peace that I want so bad that says, even though everybody else is saying this, I care about God's approval in my life. And they can say what they want to say, but I know if I'm on the right path for me, and even though everybody's saying all this stuff, I'm okay. Amen. And I'm not living for their approval, but I'm living for God's approval. That's the peace that I want. And Paul, in the book of Galatians, he has this awesome line. He says this in Galatians 1.10. Obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. If I was trying to please people, if that was my goal, I wouldn't even be doing this because that's not what this is about. And Paul has this piece, I think that Mary had of like, hey, people are saying all sorts of stuff, whatever a little bit, you know, because I'm living for God's approval in my life and I'm following where he's leading me and that's what's most important. And we can find peace when we live for God's approval, not people's approval. So Mary teaches us in this story. And number three, peace is found in seeing God's faithfulness through the journey. Peace is found in seeing his faithfulness through the journey. There's a great moment that happens. So they get to the stable in Bethlehem. They have the baby. The shepherds arrive. All of that stuff happens that we know from the Christmas story. And everybody, you know, all the shepherds are all freaking out that this is amazing. They're astonished. They start telling everybody all over the place that like all of this busyness and craziness is happening. And you get this verse in Luke 2, 19. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. And other translations will say that she treasured these things and she pondered and she thought about them all the time. 
And I think this is just a little window into this reality for Mary that she's sitting there in this moment, all this stuff is going on, but what she's doing is she's like, how good is God? She's sitting there holding that baby and everybody recognizes what this moment is and she recognizes the significance of the moment. She goes, how good is God? Every step of the way he's been there and I'm gonna store all these things up, all of these memories, all of these moments, they're treasures for me and I'm gonna think about them and remember them and keep them with me. She's finding peace because she's seen God's faithfulness throughout the journey. And I think that's an exercise for us that's so good to recognize in every single moment, okay, God's been faithful. He's been so good. And let me store those things up. Let me remember those things and treasure those things because God is faithful to me every step of the way, just the way he was for Mary. And she gets to that spot in that moment, in that manger, and she goes, all of this, I'm gonna store it up. And she's so thankful and she's seen God's faithfulness and it gives her peace and she treasures those things in her heart. And so to end right here, I wanted to just say that like all week long writing this message, I had to fight so hard my knee-jerk reaction to put in all, all these caveats and all of this, hey, like I know this is super hard and it's difficult to do this. And here's all the reasons why it's difficult to do this. And we're gonna mess up in this. We're gonna get knocked down in God's grace and thank God for all that. Absolutely, all that's true, 100%. But also I wanted to lean into the, the thing that's different about Mary and you is nothing. Like there's nothing different. There's nothing about her that was like, oh, that's why she can do this. No, she just decided, okay, this is what I'm gonna do. And I'm sure she had her moments and I'm sure that every now and then along that journey, she probably had times where she did freak out a little bit or panic or whatever, but she had this continual, I'm gonna come back to this place that goes, this is the path that he has me on. And that's where I'm gonna find peace. So I'm gonna focus on him and trust in him. And I want us to see that challenge and not be freaked out by it, but I want us to go, that's what I want. Like, I don't wanna be knocked around all the time. And when things don't go the way I thought they would, I don't wanna freak out every time that happens. But instead, can I be like Mary and can I go, may it be to me exactly as you said. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna walk that out. I'm gonna trust you. And it might not be what I thought, but that's okay because my expectations were never what I wanted. What I want is you. What I want is your presence. What I want is you in my life. And so I will follow wherever you are leading me. Like I know it's hard but it, it, we can do hard things. We can, you know? I know it's gonna be difficult. I know we're gonna mess up. All of that's true, but I wanna follow after that. And I want that example. I want to do what Mary did. And I thought about it too. But like, what's the thing that we got in this exchange? What did we get out of this, right? Like, I've gotta do some hard things and I've gotta encounter some difficult moments and I've gotta to choose to lay down my expectations and I've gotta to choose to follow where God has me. And that's gonna be difficult absolutely amen. But what did I get out of that? Continuing to live that life, I got a savior who saved my life and went to the cross for me and took all of my sins on himself so I can live free for all eternity. Sign me up. Absolutely. Will I do some hard things? And absolutely, will I accept the challenge like Mary does to say, absolutely, God, if you've got something different for me and it's difficult and it's hard and it's going to make people talk about me and I've got to lay down my expectations, sign me up because I wanna be with you. And I'm so thankful for who you are and what you've done in my life that I, absolutely will I do this. That's the call I think for all of us. That's what I want. And I hope that's what all of us want. So let's stand, I'm gonna pray for us. Let's pray. Jesus, um, we love you. God, we thank you that you do have a path of peace for us. God, that there's a path in our life, God, that you've laid out. God, there are things that you want us to do. God, there are places that you've called us to. God, you've given us jobs. And God, you've given us a task in our time here. And so, God, I pray like Mary, we could be people, God, that we hold loosely to our expectations, to our plans and to our goals. But God, that we're people that are actively and desperately seeking, where are you guiding me? What is it you have for me? And, and God, when you come and ask us for those things, God, would we like Mary lay down our expectations and say, may it be to me exactly as you've said. I want to walk that path that you have for me. God, help us to value you over our expectations. Help us to trust you, Jesus, 
and keep our thoughts fixed on you. God, we wanna experience that perfect peace talked about in Isaiah. So help us, Holy Spirit, to focus and to fix our thoughts on you and trust you. And know that even when things are out of whack, when things are different than what we thought, when situations are rough and difficult, I can have peace in my life because you're with me and I trust you. And I know that things are gonna work out God, you're gonna cause things to work out in some way that I can't understand or see, but I know that you're with me. And I pray that God, when we find those moments where we see it, that we like Mary, God, would treasure those things and think about them, God, we'd store them up. God, that we could have a huge, just a build up, God, of all these moments where you've been faithful and you've been good and we store those things and that brings us peace. God, I don't wanna be knocked around anymore. I don't want to be a person when things start to fall off what I thought they would be, that I start to panic and freak out. Help me to trust you and know that you have got me if I continue to follow and trust in you. And help us to experience that peace this Christmas and moving forward. We love you, Jesus. We just pray this in your name. Amen. 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 So we do, we're gonna worship.